Hello again. This is lecture two called Physical Adaptations Regarding Survival in a Wild World. We're going to start out, then move in. Out as in we're going to start really out. Out in the universe, for example. And how physical characteristics pretty much shape our survival. Okay, settle in and enjoy. Right, everything has a shape, okay? Everything that is perceived by living creatures has a shape. The shape is the first impression received by the brain along with sound. Inside the shape is the huge factors of both minor and major features that determine our species. Inside those features lie our gender, our race, our family, survival techniques, sexuality and physical adaptations that determine our longevity and success as a species. A fish cannot be confused with a bird, for example, or an elephant with an ostrich. But I feel there is one universal design that underlies every living creature and every non-living creature and state of matter in the known universe. I call this the circle of reality. A galaxy in the universe is composed of a supermassive black hole which is a star that has run out of thermonuclear energy and in actual fact is going flat and is collapsing back on itself but has left its gravitational force still intact. This force then acts as a giant hoover sucking everything into a center of unreality that's called the singularity, where matter ceases to exist, known physics break down and scientists lose a lot of sleep over this. The edge of this cosmic whirlpool is circular, it's called the event horizon, which is where basically it's the last thing you see before it disappears into the black hole. And the whole galaxy is circular, whirling around the black center. Stars, which are circular, make up the arms of the galaxy, which are circular in shape. Our star, called the Sun, which is circular, is orbited by planets, which are circular, and orbit in a circular shape, travelling at thousands of miles an hour, in a roughly, once again, circular or elliptical shape, which is a drawn-out circle. Orbiting our Earth is our Moon, which is circular. Our circular Earth is composed of matter, both living and non-living. This matter, which is constructed by circular atoms, consists of a nucleus which is round, orbited by atoms which are also moving around the circular um, nucleus in a circular orbit. These atoms make up our eyes, which are circular, which lead to our brains, which are composed of atoms, which are circular, which lead to the electrical synapses in our brain that, in the perception path, leads in a roughly circular shape, which finally leads us to our own circle of reality. Hence, the universal shape that governs everything is circular. Eastern philosophy has a saying that is both full and empty, and has no beginning and end. So the shape of the universe as we know it is circular. There's an image of a black hole. You can see the event horizon on the outside, everything being sucked in. Still unknown, it's still very much of an unknown quantity. Then we get the planets. As you can see, they are circular. Um, as for the shape of the universe, we know it is expanding. Galaxies moving away from us are more pronounced than galaxies moving in. They seem to be emanating from a central point that we know as the Big Bang. Now, in a black hole where matter is crushed out of existence, where does it go? Is there such things being crushed out of existence? One theory is that it is reborn as a giant explosion in another alternative universe, and then time begins there. Hence the Big Bang. Sound familiar? Now, African huts are circular because they believe 
for every evil spirit needs a corner to hide in. And if it doesn't have a corner, it cannot be it cannot live in the same dwelling as them, hence a circular shape. In the Old Testament, we get the book of Isaiah. It says, He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Now we only discovered that the earth was not flat a couple of hundred years ago, but in the book of Isaiah, 740 to 860 BC, somehow they knew that the earth was circular. Which is, when you think about it, it's pretty crazy. Also, the word orbit comes from the word orbis, which is the Latin word for circle. Okay, that's just an introduction to what I perceive as shapes. Everything has a shape, a fish has a shape, a bird has a shape, animals have a shape, we have a shape. But the universal the universal theme of shapes is circular. Right, living creatures, adaptations for survival, physical characteristics. Let's go, for example, to the giraffe again. Obviously, our first port of call is a distinguishing feature of its incredibly long neck. This appendage has only seven vertebrae, and it's a perfect example of nature's topiary, or topiarist. Sunlight has to reach the ground for seeds to germinate and grass to grow. The giraffe is a specialist top canopy feeder in the natural world. The elephant is a middle feeder and top feeder, with the smaller species like impala pruning the foliage down to bush level. This brings, this brings down sunlight, and also acts as a natural inhibitor to bush encroachment onto grassland and also gives the tree its uniform shape. The heart of a giraffe is incredibly powerful as to pump blood all the way up that winding highway against gravity to reach the brain is no mean feat. Now, this animal has to drink water by lowering its head to the level of its hooves to reach the water hole. To counteract the sudden rush of blood to the brain by gravity release, the arteries have a special kind of a non-return valve that effectively cancels the blood flow, thereby ensuring the animal cannot keep its head down very long, because if it had a rush of blood to the brain, it would get dizzy and possibly fall over. Now, the funny thing is, is that when they hold the head down like that, as I said before, the blood doesn't get to the brain, so they can only keep his head down for a certain amount of time. And often I've seen, um, when lions hunt giraffe, which is not very often, but they do, they tend to herd them or chase them towards a tar road or a tarmac. And because of their front back gait, which is totally different to left or right gait when they're running, they stumble. And I've seen the lioness jump onto the, the um, giraffe's neck and just hold the head down, not bite the throat or anything. And the and the, and the um, absence of blood soon makes the animal fall unconscious. Okay, coming next, we get to the elephant. That's an old bull, a photograph of the water hole at the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. The huge Africa-shaped ears act as huge radiators, with all the major blood vessels looping around just under the thin skin. Flapping their ears thus helps to cool the blood down. An important function in for a three-ton grey bulk living in African temperatures. The trunk, which is a modified upper lip and nose, has approximately 60,000 type of muscles and is the most versatile organ in the animal kingdom. It functions as a weapon, a nose, an arm with two fingers and a means of communication with stylized movements. Personal observation for myself. And as a secondary mouth sucking water up to squirt down its vast thirsty gullet. More of them later. Lions. The mane of the male is there to protect the neck as the male does all the fighting to first establish then protect his pride. Being challenged by nomadic males who want a sex life and his females, he will often eat first, not having to hunt, as the female cubs rely on him to live. Should he get deposed, the cubs are immediately disposed of by the incoming male, killed, as adoption and infanticide in, in, in lion society is well known. But adoption is not. The funny thing is, the penis of a male lion has several barbs that tear 
the female's vagina during intercourse, causing pain which, co which causes her to turn around and slap him and triggers her into oustless. Grabbing her behind the neck triggers the infantile response and keeps her placid. Have you seen the lioness carrying her cubs? The second she grabs behind the neck of the cub, the cub goes limp. Same thing with the male. When he's mating with the female, he grabs her behind the neck, which also makes her calm right down and keeps her placid. The males have a scent organ inside their mouth, called Jacobson organ. And this acts as a scent radar, picking up the female's highly pungent scent and causing the, the males to grimace. It's a bit like um, if you smell something very powerful, it makes you grimace. Same with them as well. Okay, once again we get to the cheetah. Okay, we'll explain to him before. Funny thing about cheetah is that, once again, those spots. Those spots help to break up the outline in the heat haze during the day over the open fields. Small head that cuts down on wind resistance, once again. Okay, huge lungs, maximum oxygen intake, black tear ducts, ch ch uh, channels tears away from the eyes. The flattish rudder hunts during the day because they can't hunt at night because they can't hit anything. Fastest also, um, they got what they call a certain kind of muscle which is called a high twitch fiber muscle. Two types of muscle you get the slow, very heavy lifting, powerful muscles like, for example, body builds for slow, powerful lifting. Then you get the fast twitch fiber muscles that you find in martial arts. It's very quick response, and that's what the cheetah uses all the time with the fast twitch muscles to get to those speeds. Another physical adaptation as well. Coming to birds, we get the woodpecker. Now the brain of a woodpecker has a special hinge that encases the brain and passes beneath the skull vault. This ensures the brain stays motionless and cushioned from the shock of drilling into the bark. Coming up again, we get vultures. The eyesight of this family of birds is legendary. The lens can change its shape the most out of all the birds, acting as a giant zoom lens. Appearing suddenly out of a blue sky, they will congregate onto a carcass and commence with the most incredible act of sanitation in the natural world. The first, vul the first vultures on the scene is a low-flying, lapid faced vulture who, with this huge sturdy beak, is perfectly adapted to open the tough skin and outer layers of the carcass. Flying higher, and with his eyes noticing the descent of the leopard face, we get the white back vulture. Whose medium sized beak basically does the vulture's share of the gorging. He flops ungainly down from the heavens and joins a party. Flying even higher, we get the hooded the palm nut and the Egyptian vultures. They have specialized thin beaks as you can see, especially designed for deboning the meat and getting in between the smaller bones. So we get three different types of beak sizes. The first one's got the huge big cleaver knife kind of beak, beak opens up the carcass. We get the white back that comes down with the smaller knife that eats the meat or the lion's share or the vulture share with the meat. And then we get the hooded vulture seen here and the Egyptian and palm nut that has a very small beak as you can see act as deboning. Going back to the white back vulture you see they've got bald heads and often you find that their head goes deep inside the carcass right, and uh, to eat the blood and the gore and the meat and that's just to stop their feathers from getting caked with blood like that. Also a fantastic thing about vultures is that they act as nature's sanitizers. What they do is when they eat, say for example an animal dies of anthrax or rabies even, the virus is still in the meat, it's still there. The vultures come down, they start to feed off this carcass and the amazing thing is, is that the stomach acids kill the virus and when the dung comes out the other side it is sterile. So they basically act as actually chemical agents to stop the disease from spreading. This coupled with the tender, um, attention of the hyenas, the Madibu stalks and jackals ensure a highly effective clean-up operation that helps stop diseases and pestilence. 
pipelines that take gas over long distance. We have um, introduced a gas called ethanol, which is a gas produced by rotting meat. So if there is a break in the pipeline, or there's a breach, the ethanol mixed in with the gas will go into the air and the vultures are attracted by the smell of ethanol. They will then come down to the pipeline searching for the rotten meat. And um, then we can see them circling down and then we can go and um, repair the actual break in the pipe. Humans have used a physical adaptation for the natural world for their own advantage, the most obvious, right, being the vultures mentioned above. In helicopters, right, we get a design feature very similar to the dragonfly with its low-flung carriage designed for dragging, to picking things up and taking them somewhere else. In tanks, we get a leaf out of the chameleon's book, right? Um, but it's with um, with its turret eyes that can turn around and see from uh, basically everything from either side. The same with a tank as well. From fish, we get the fins for our feet, okay, and also the snorkel as well that certain insects use to breathe underwater by having a little snorkel, like that. Termite, termite mounds, once again, is my favourite subject. Okay, the termites have perfected, once again, actually engineering on a genetic level, which as yet, we have yet to do research, and the termite mound has come under scrutiny for its similarity with the human ecosystem. It has a central queen, which is a heart of the colony. A cosmic consciousness, similar to the force in Star Wars, whereby... If the soldiers are out foraging, out in the fields, and the queen gets killed in a mound, some distance away, they stop work. They stand with their feelers in the air, as if tuning into this force, then hurriedly make their way back to the castle. The queen replacement then begins in earnest. Whales and dolphins and elephants have perfected sonar, low frequency sounds for communication. Because look, sound travels four times faster in water. And I remember working as a dive master in Mozambique. We used to go out into the deep into the ocean from land and find a sound channel. And we do what we call the deep blue dive. We go down to about 10, 12 meters. And because sound travels four times faster in water, we could hear the humpback whales calling to each other over thousands of miles a most beautiful sonorous spiritual sound and um, they have been using that for thousands of years we've only just discovered that elephants use the same thing as well they can actually communicate through the pads of their feet because the sound travels through the ground and they can communicate with their toes then we came on the scene we use sonar we use sonar to find submarines, thereby disturbing their natural sonar path that they use through the oceans. And to make things even worse, we blew up the sea. We thought it was clever to put an atomic bomb underwater and blow up an island and everything else around it. This happened to God many times at Bikini Atoll. And we wonder why whales and dolphins get stranded especially nowadays. We should not be exploding nuclear bombs anyway, but it seems like we have, and we keep on doing so, which is pretty stupid in my opinion, but there you go. Right, the relevance to ourselves. Obviously, it would take many, or many, many um, volumes to carry on what I've just been talking because the field of research there is absolutely huge. Right. The naked ape, Homo sapien, us. In treading carefully in that minefield of our physical characteristics, we come some very strange features and mysteries indeed. Why are we hairless over most of our bodies? It's a known fact that sweating is one of the most efficient ways of system cooling amongst land-based bipedal organisms. Out of all the primates, our system has evolved this ability the most to enter a niche of daylight hunting. 
The gap in the evolutionary computer required an upright hunter that could walk, not run, but walk in the heat of Africa where most animals are in a torpor and inactive and require a species or a predator to fill that niche in species control, i.e. the heat of the day. We are highly adapted to walk long distances. Being covered in fur would make us overheat very quickly. The highly efficient sweat system kicks in cooling us down. Eyebrows would block sweat from running into our eyes. Our plantigrade walk, and I stress the word plantigrade. Plantigrade means flat footed. Okay. This is an old hunting scene from the Bushman Caves and the Bushman paintings. Right? Plantigrade is flat footed, which would make us cover long distances. Feet flat. On stalking, we would change it to diggity trade, which means on our tiptoes, stalking forward in the thick bush. Then, for the run, we would go to an gully grade, which is the run, right? which is tiptoe for running. We're the only organism that has that ability to change the shape of our foot for three different mechanisms of hunting. The walk, the stalk, and the run. The vitamin D from the meat diet would go into building our large brains. The dark pigmentation would have helped against sunlight, with the lighter genes variants kicking in when Homo sapiens started to migrate out of Africa. Body lice would have been eliminated though not completely. The San Bushman tribe of desert regions in southern Africa have developed large fat reserves on the buttocks. Sight of the most protein is on the buttocks, which is why if you watch a kill on a lion kill on an impala or a tiger kill on an antelope they start feeding from the buttocks first because that is where the protein is concentrated so it would seem to us that the hairless situation is primarily an adaptation to a hunting technique to fill an ancient ecological niche i mean i've seen bushmen and i myself have enjoyed jogging we grab a gun and we jog and we run we run we run and then when we find the tracks, we start stalking. It often wonders me why jogging is so um, popular in the world. It's not just for physical fitness, obviously, but it's that feeling you get when you jog and you run and your endorphin, some endorphin kicks in. I think it's some kind of echo of an old hunting technique where you just want to keep on going. Just a thought. However, this does not explain the vestigial hair regions of the pubic hair, armpits and head. It is possible that the pubis is a sign of sexual maturity, much like the organs of a female baboon whose when she is sexually mature or in heat, they swell up. And the armpits are a help in scent and the pheromone manufacture. The hair on the head could be to help keep the brain cool and the indistinct body hair is the last echo of the transitory period from hairy and, and ponderous hominids prone to overheating and with small brains to hairless, fleet-footed humanoids with large brains, highly intelligent and with an efficient cooling system designed for hot weather, long-distance hunting. Our thumbs are the only digits in the primate world that can move independently from the hand thus enabling us to fashion the tools we need to hunt. We did not evolve fangs, claws or poison glands. Instead, we grew large brains and mobile thumbs to fashion the tools out and also to work out the hunting techniques that we could use to fulfil that niche. We evolved fingernails and toenails with which to control body lice and undertake very delicate tasks as well as to being able to scratch a rather irritating itch, which, as you know, is very pleasurable. I'm often stuck with this obsession with tanning and turning brown, sunbathing, tanning parlours, even at the expense of your health, just to go a darker colour. Could this be a hollow echo, buried deep in our brains, of the old hunting adaptation that manifests itself as a fashion statement? Another thing is that obsession. People get obsessed with what wealth or with someone else or 
with cars or with whatever. That totally enslaves the individual with an all-consuming passion that is ultimately self-destructive. Is that possibly an echo of the hunting drive? That live or die situation where all the senses are attuned to a highly important goal and that is to kill your quarry so that you may live. Another aspect of our ties with the natural world is the uncanny fact that human females in a group in a natural environment such as a game reserve or any other wild place time their oestrogen cycles to, con- to coincide with, each, with each, um, each other. So in other words, their period falls on exactly the same time frame as each other and it went totally out of their control. Right, all organisms give birth to atrocial young, like a monkey, or precocial young, like a rhinoceros. Now the atrocial young, okay, coming back to the monkey, Right, the atrocial young are born totally dependent, so they have a very short gestation period, where the white rhino, for example, um, can f- um, is born fully formed, so they have a long um, gestation period to help the baby form in the womb. Right, human babies, however, have a long gestation period of nine months, yet they are born atrocial totally dependent on their parents. Human babies are born with their brains less than 30% of their adult size. The human birth canal, which is an adaptation to our long distance hunting, is much smaller than slower, more sentient primates. So most of our brain growing occurs outside of birth. Chimpanzee babies are born with 40% of their ability, which is as our close cousin, which if enforced on us due to the slow metabolism the slow metabolism of human mothers would enforce a 20-month gestation period. A very unrealistic survival situation in the harsh, unforgiving environment of the ancient natural world. However, at six months mark, the human mother's metabolism is blasting off like a hurricane, and it is, and it is of no wonder that she is unable to maintain the life support system and growing gains of the baby, so the ninth so the nine-month time span kicks in, which eases out the process. We hold the second longest gestation in primates, with the orangutan being the first. Another feature is our unusually short intestine. When we discovered and tamed fire, we were the first creatures to discover the natural foodstuff's molecular composition could be changed. For example, rice grains could now be utilised. They were basically undigestible and could now be boiled to change it completely and reverse it to a usable, digestible product. Fire, as I think as it could well be imagined, is one of the closest and one of the most powerful evolutionary steps we have ever taken. As a, as a result, we evolved a shorter intestine because we outsourced a large proportion of our body's job. It could be said that the harnessing of fire with its protectionist and dietary qualities was one of the greatest leaps in our evolutionary process once again. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit, slightly bit about the gut, about our stomach. Now, or also about our body as well. The tonsillar ring around the throat is where the immune cells are trained in the first seven years of a, tra- of a child's life. Training camps for our body's immune system. Saliva is blood minus the red blood corpuscles and is stronger than morphine. Instinctively, we know how our bodies work by inventing cooking. Proteins are broken down the gut by acids. Eat a raw egg, vomit, nice subject, I'm sure, it comes out cooked, scrambled. We outsourced a major body function and saved energy so we could concentrate on intelligence and hunting with our large brains. The final meter of our large intestine constantly checks salt and water levels and saves us from having to drink an extra litre of water a day. Also another hunting um, gift we've been given. Also more nutrients are, are, are absorbed, which is why suppositories work so well as they bypass the liver and go straight to the source. Funny enough, most of our body weight comes from what we breathe. 
plants draw the majority of their weight from the air, not the soil. Now nature ripens a fruit, fruit sorry, through energy. We eat fruit to produce energy. All living things are molecules made out of sugar, amino acids and fats. On the purely molecular level, there is no difference between an apple and a cow. On an evolutionary scale, we process, we, sorry, we process sugar the fastest for bursts of energy. An old hunting technique once again, for sudden, quick, sustained burst of energy. All living things, sorry, sugar is now everywhere, and our instinct is to load up on sugar. Hence the problems that we get. Now wheat has a poison. The more it is used, the more poison it will produce to try and protect itself, due to its very short reproductive cycle. So we get what we call a gluten intolerant. Eating too much wheat, and gluten is a poison. The lactose is found in milk. Now, the gene for absorbing lactose switches off with age at 75% of the population. So it's not absorbed in the lower intestine, but is relished by the large intestines and we get flatulence as we get older. Evolution did not allow for tropical fruit to be available on shelves in Europe during winter. So we get a fructose intolerance. Fructose also has trifononon, which builds serotonin. I know all these big words, sorry. Serotonin is the happy drug. But we get too much fractose, so the body dumps fractose, which then takes away the serotonin, which equals depression. Serotonin also makes one feel full after eating. Lack of serotonin, so you're snacking constantly, so you get overweight. Hunters, hunter-gatherers, ate up to 500 different plants and foods a year. We have at the most 17. So it comes down to the brass fact that we are basically coming back from an old evolutionary cycle of the hunting days. We were designed to hunt. We were designed to run long distances, walk long distances, stalk, make the kill, and eat. That is basically one part of our physical adaptations to what we, to what, to what we are now. Very, very much so. Okay, that concludes lecture two. Um, I, it's a very, I don't know. I'm going to go more into into wilderness and how we how we rely on the wilderness and how we use wilderness. But that is just a slight example of our physical adaptations that we have coming down from the universe itself with its circles, galaxy circle, black holes, planets, moons. Our eyes are circular. Our orbits are circular. And um, yes, just basically. Our physical adaptations and this is there is much more to go into as this course carries on we'll go into much more of that on a much deeper level and on the spiritual side of it all it gets even more interesting right thank you for listening and i'll see you on the next lecture bye